Jason Bateman meets Russell Crowe. If they had a son, it would be James. <laughs> Next on Rugby Wrap-Up, England Sevens captain Tom Mitchell, Tiger rugby revolutionizer James Walker, and the world's most clever play-by-play man, Nick Heath, calling in from the World 10 Series in Bermuda. Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by The Pig and Whistle, the world's best rugby pub, the Murphy Kennedy Group, founded with the idea that construction can be done better. And Lean and Limber, stretching your way to a healthier lifestyle. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy in Midtown Manhattan talking rugby, and we're not talking 15s, we're not talking 7s today, we're talking 10s. And who better to do that with than the guys that are down in Bermuda sunning themselves as uh, administrator, broadcaster, and player, Mr. James Walker, Mr. Nick Heath, and Mr. Tom Mitchell, all down at the World 10s Series. Is that correct, James? That is correct, Matt. You can, you're allowed to elaborate. <laughs> yes, this is a World show. 10, it's the World 10 Series. I would, uh, I would include that it's not 15s, it's not 7s, it's not league, and it's not American football. All right, so, Tom, before I get to you, Nick, have you called a 10s match before? I have. I was fortunate enough to be in Singapore in 2014 for uh, the World Club 10s, and then there were a couple of iterations of that uh, in Mauritius. And, uh, and actually, by the time I was doing the kind of second and third versions of those, I felt even in, even in the commentary box as, as a lowly broadcaster that actually some of the teams that were turning up for those tournaments without enough of the big guys in their pack that thought it was just seven, sevens plus three uh, were, were gently getting schooled. So uh, you've only got to watch 10 through a while to understand that actually there is a little bit more to it than that. So, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a really, really good form of the game and there, there's plenty in it for the big guys as well, which I'm sure we'll be seeing uh, in Bermuda over the next, uh, next two, three weeks. All right, so Thomas, for people that live in a cave and don't know you, you're the captain of England Sevens. You've been with England Sevens since 2012. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Team GB for the Olympics in 2016. Was that a silver? Yep, it was. Yeah, silver medal in Rio 2016. Heartbreak not winning the gold? Of course. But yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. We're hoping to go one better next summer. All right, we, we were speaking off camera. I was spewing jealousy about your hair. <laughs> you got, you're like the English Fabio. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get, a fair bit of, I get a fair bit of abuse about it. So it's nice to have some compliments, Matt. So I'll, I'll come back on the show for sure. If that's what you're, you're angling for, then it's work. Well, it's like the guys that are giving you shit for it probably have shitty hair. That, that's all I'm going <laughs> to say. I take that all day long. But in all seriousness... Very, very good long career with England Sevens, and you guys have hit a road bump, so to speak. Why don't you enlighten us on the latest with England Sevens and the financial woes? Yeah, it's been a bit of a tough situation for us recently, um, as it has been for a lot of teams, to be fair, but our program has been completely shut down um, from the end of August. We were kind of, after having a period of, of being uh, on furlough from our contracts anyway, we were, the program's completely shut down, and Pretty uncertain future. Obviously, everyone hoping to push on to the Olympics next year, 2021 out in Tokyo. That's been the thing we've been working towards for the last four years anyway. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a shock and guys have had to adapt and find their own ways to keep ticking over, both in a rugby sense, but also in a, you know, in terms of making a living and everything else that goes with it. So, yeah, it's been tough. And, um, you know, from a rugby point of view, it's great to have something like this to, to come and hone our skills, um, pitch ourselves against some, some different beasts out on the field as well, as Nick kind of touched upon already. It's, it's not sevens, it's something a little bit different. And, you know, for someone like me, who's um, been in the game for a while, it's nice to have a bit of a different challenge. Where on the field are you lining up in tens? I don't want to give away too much. You know, You're going to know I, the minute I, you march out. To be, to be honest, I think if I say front row, the guys will, uh, will know I'll be lying. Now, I'll probably I'll be half back, so nine or ten. Um, wherever I can kind of shout at people and try and tell them what to do, it'd be nice. Um, but yeah, we're kind of, it's, it's funny because obviously, you know, teams are coming together and, you know, learning about where guys play and what their skill set is and, and who they are as people as well, which has is is been a really cool experience for the first kind of week or so. All right. So 
we, I kind of jumped ahead here because this is the way this organically happens on Rugby Wrap-Up. But, James, you're basically, I believe you and Paul Holmes are the, are the brain trust behind this. Is that accurate? No, it's a, it's, it's a partnership between uh, Tiger Rugby, which is Paul and I, and um, our friends over at Karanat Sports Marketing. They've got quite a history of putting on TENS events um, around the world, World Cup TENS. Uh, they also did the World Schools Festivals. So they've got you know, a lot of experience uh, putting these kinds of events on. Uh, but obviously, this is at a completely different scale. Um, funnily enough, both uh, Karanat and Tiger were kind of uh, coming up with the same idea at the same time. We went to Hong Kong a few years ago um, and just fell in love with the version of the game at the professional level. Um, and then we immediately started thinking of, you know, how we could take this into a league format. Uh, what would it look like if we changed some of the rules? Um, how do we get American players and American uh, eyeballs more interested in the game? Um, and that's how we, we start to come up with some of the, you know, the new rules of this new sport, which is quite frankly the way we see it. Let's just explain the basics. 10 minute halves. I'm gonna, I'm the king of dumb questions, by the way. There's a few little uh, idiosyncrasies that you'll see this weekend when we kick off. And yes, it will be shown in the United States and we're hoping to make that announcement tomorrow, but it will be available in the United States. Um, we're just dotting I's and crossing T's, first of all. Um, but yeah, the, the, the major, you know, the, the big overview is this. You show up at a tournament with 20 players. Uh, prior to each round, uh, the coach selects 16 that are dressed out to start. The other four are off. They cannot be used as subs. Um, 10 minute halves. If the coach of England wants to, uh, of London, wants to take Tom and sit him until tomorrow, he can. If he wants to rest his legs, he can do that. But obviously every match counts in the point system, in the scoring system. So uh, we definitely going to see a lot of player rotation happening to keep the legs fresh. But yeah, so 16 before each round. So you can have 16 players playing round one, force it out the next round that four can come in and rest another four squad members do you have a what is it called a force majeure clause in there because you got a pending hurricane potentially coming through or something like that a tropical you know what, or that thing the called the covid everything was, everything was always running so smoothly without the hurricane we needed something to to get <laughs> no i mean listen we, we just i think you're the only guy on the planet that would say we, something was running smoothly in the yeah, we, with covid 19 the, hovering uh, right we're waiting for the rivers of blood and uh, and the frogs to come falling out of the sky right now but but no, I mean, in, in all honesty, uh, as Tom can tell you and Nick can tell you, you go to the stadium right now and the pitch is just absolutely unbelievable. Um, our only concern right now would be on, you know, putting on some, up some of the tents and the banners and the, the signage. A lot of our signage is virtual anyways, uh, because this is kind of a made for TV version due to our sure. COVID restrictions. So yeah, there's some worry about it, um, but we don't want to, you know, get ahead of ourselves. The teams themselves, uh, owners are all separate, uh, separately owned teams because you've got what? You've got uh, the Ohio Aviators, the, the revamping of your boys up in Ohio from the pro rugby USA days. Right. Miami Suns, Lo London Royals, who's Tom, Tom, you're with, right? Uh, SFX, South Africa, where Connor Wallace Sims is ending up. Frankie Horn is the coach. Uh, Cecil Africa, the newest MLR signee for the San Diego Legion, is with them. Asia Pacific Dragons and the Rhinos out of California. So are these, how are these teams managed or the ownership? and They are individual owners. Um, some of them have needed a bit more help this year than they would need next year, obviously, because of the short timelines and travel restrictions from certain countries. We had a team out of Buenos Aires that was ready to go, but we just couldn't get the travel restrictions lifted. So we're down to seven teams, unfortunately, but they'll be in next year. Um, so very excited about that. Very excited about the, the level of owners that we're talking to. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, next year, the minimum, we do only a minimum salary. Um, there's no salary cap. So the minimum salary for rookies is going to be a uh, thousand US dollars a week or 4,000 a month. Um, and then up from there. So, you know, <clears throat> by the caliber of owner that we have, involved we think that the series is absolutely going to explode next year and is this a precursor for getting the ohio aviators into the mlr listen i don't you know i've spoken a little bit to uh, to tom rooney about that and you can you can talk to him i know he's looked at getting in the mlr for for years but i don't think that's the intention of of this uh of this team i think they are fully invested in the uh world 10 series and gonna see where it takes them 
not that they would wouldn't take on the MLR. I think they are again intrigued, and we all know that the MLR is going places. It's just a matter of time; it's going to explode. So uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But we as a we as a World Ten Series, you know, again we we separate from from union, separate from league. Uh, we encourage the boys to move on to uh, to play uh, league or or union. It doesn't it doesn't matter to us. Fair enough. All right, gentlemen, hold that thought because we do have to take a quick break, but we will be right back with the boys in Bermuda after this. I've been blind since I was four, and I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label. None of that stuff influences me. I drink beer because of the taste, and my beer is Paps Blue Ribbon. It has the taste and the flavor. What do you think is on the label? I think there's a, a naked woman Riding on a unicorn, jumping over fire. Oh, that's good beer. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. And we are back, Matt McCarthy, in New York City, with the boys down in Bermuda. Nick, you're down there, and I'm as jealous of you as I am of Tom and his hair. Uh, you got That's a nice gig. Right. I've been watching. We've been seeing the videos uh, that you've been putting out. Did you bring enough sunblock for three weeks? I know this is the problem, isn't it? My, my main thing is always having the factor 50 in the right place, but then forgetting to put it on to take it with me when I go out. So, uh, yeah. And, and the nature of Bermuda kind of they say everything's 20 minutes. But if you're one side of the island, it's 40 minutes. And that's a long scooter ride without any sun cream on. So. Uh, so, yeah, look, it's uh, it's an amazing place to be uh, for this tournament. And uh, the opportunity to to be able to to see a bit of paradise this kind of rugby and paradise element that, that a lot of people are talking about is is a fantastic one the difficulty when you're when you're in my shoes and you've got to get your commentary prep done on 160 athletes you're you're looking to try and create little bits of content to make sure that we can keep the social side alive whilst you've got you know beautiful azure blue waters and sandy beaches screaming at you outside to go and play so uh, these uh, the offices in these parts while albeit while it's a nice place to be are, uh, are harder to get the job done in terms of focus that's for sure and you've got some some pretty big names down there yeah look we've uh, we've been really lucky and and i think one of the one of the key things that that the world 10 series has done is is speak to people that are, have been looking for an opportunity and and as tom talked about obviously that figures to a lot of the england sevens boys to the kenyans to uh, to some of the welsh sevens guys as well luke trahan and and those boys who are here as well um there are plenty of these these players that haven't had the opportunity that they would have liked to have, have been made redundant from their unions uh we've got teams who've come over from southern kings the club there's been put into liquidation you know COVID and the various changes that have gone on across the world have, have affected people on a very personal and, and deep level, but it's also contractual for sportsmen in terms of not being able to do what they what they would like to be doing day in, day out. And, and you can see the smiles on the faces from so many of these guys that are here. They want to be told when to turn up, what to wear, what to eat, when training finishes, and then when they can go and find the best coffee house in, in town. And, and I think all of those boxes have been ticked. And, and actually, it's great to see, see you know, everyone back together and the bromances. We're even, you know, rolling out the carpet for JP Doyle, who was set aside by the RFU in terms of the premiership in England recently. So there's, there's a lot of good stories out there about, about what the World 10 Series is doing to bring people to the island. Um, the, the, co the COVID testing system, you have to arrive with a negative test. You get tested off the plane day four, day eight, day 14. It's, uh, it, it's proving itself to be, uh, you know, a, a pretty impressive setup. And, uh, and let's just hope that, that the players and the action on the pitch can follow suit. So, Tom, he mentioned some names. You're running across some guys and you might be playing against some of your former teammates. Because uh, I'm not familiar yet with the rosters as of this taping. But I know that a guy like Connor Wallace-Sims is playing for a South African setup, right? Is he playing for Frankie Horn? And you've got 
you got Turner down there, and Matt Turner, and you got Norton down there. So who's playing with who, as far as you know right now, that you played with? Uh, it's a mismatch. It's like a mixed match, to be honest. But there's definitely a few sevens guys dotted around. Um, the thing that'd be more interesting is kind of the unknown entities who are out there. Um, walking around the dinner hall, there's probably a few bigger boys than I'm used to seeing around the seven series, which um, is, is a challenge and an opportunity, depending on who's got the ball at the time. <laughs> um, but that's exciting. It is cool, though, because there are guys who have played, like it's a truly global mix of players here. It's awesome. You've got guys from all over the world. Um, guys who, yeah, with the sevens background, with the fifteens background. Some guys who actually played probably a, a hell of a lot of tens. Some who have never played tens before. Um, and that's quite, that's quite a cool mix. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of unfamiliar uh, territory that we're going to be going over, but certainly pretty exciting. Did I ask you if you played tens? You haven't. I actually, I think I did play one uh, day of tens back when I was like 18 or 19. Um, I was representing Bristol Rugby, and the club's come a long way since then, actually. Um, so, yeah, but that was a, that was a way, way back. Um, did that period of time cross with Turner's time with Bristol? I think he just left. Uh, he was with England Sevens at that point. Um, but yeah, Nort Norts was, Dan Norton was still around, I think, doing, doing a few bits. And then he was there when I actually went down to train at Bristol um, for the summer. And I couldn't work out whether Norts was trying to be my best mate or he was trying to bully me. And it's kind of still the same relationship we've got now, like 10 years later. So... Hey, you're all fighting for a job, right? <laughs> yeah, I suppose so, yeah. I'll tell you what, though, Matt. I did, I did hear that, uh, that Dan Norton is pretty good at, you know, as Tom says, sort of doing the gentle bullying phone thing, often getting a rise out of people. But I, I hear it was quite a different story when they, when they found themselves at uh, Ad Admiralty House Park where there's a, there's a bit of a cliff jump and the boys were, were jumping the 20 feet or, or 25 feet down to the water. But a certain Mr. Norton wasn't so keen, was he, Tom? Well, you can imagine what it's like, you know, this was, this was day two. You just met these new guys. Um, you go to a cliff jump. No matter, you're going up to it. No matter how big it is, you know you're going to have to go off it because you don't want to let the side down in front of your new mates. Peer pressure, new mates. babe. You know. Yeah. And then, uh, so we had all done it. And then Norse is just there shaking at the top. We're trying to give him some encouragement, but we were loving it, just seeing him hating life. Eventually, he did take the plunge to be fair to him, but it, it took a bit of encouragement. You mentioned Norton. He had a run with the London Irish 15s. This, this tournament that you guys, or the series that you guys have, and this event in specific, seems to be the perfect place for MLR GMs to be scouting players. Yeah, that's right. And, and with Norton, so I actually had a good chat with the boys um, after the Cape Town 7s um, last year. And he was one of the first guys that said, listen, I'm going to put my hand up. You know, you guys can pull this off. I'm in. So it's really good to see the boys down here. But that thing, I, you know, outside the MLR, um, I think I wanted to mention was uh, we ran those combines down at IMG this year where we had athletes coming from all walks of life. And I was out watching the uh, London practice the other day. And it's just really good to see boys like Tom and Dan and Ben Foden taking some of these young guys that, quite frankly, are, are pretty lost out there and, and helping them, you know, uh, bring them along because they're off outstanding athletes, but clearly they need to to learn a new sport. So that's great to see. We've seeded um, some athletes across all the teams, um, and we feel like it's also something that we could, you know, use to ramp up um, scouting new talent into the various American leagues. So very excited about that. Um, from an MLR perspective, I can tell you, everybody has been outstanding. The sport has been fantastic from all the MLR teams signing off, letting the players just play. They realize that, that the boys are at the end of their rope. They want to get out there. They want to play some matches. And to get paid and to travel and do it in Bermuda for three weeks is not too bad. Tom, I know it's none of my business, but how much are you getting paid? No, nah, it's not your business, Matt. <laughs> so you are getting paid. <laughs> We're getting, certainly getting looked after very well so far. Um, and credit to the guys who have put this on against some difficult circumstances at the moment um i think everyone who's in the business of trying to put on tournaments in the current climate we're living in and i'm not talking about the weather out here i'm obviously talking about the difficulties with covid uh, knows how difficult it is and and so far um and things have been things have been really great so uh, we're, we're pretty grateful for that uh, and grateful for the opportunity to not only yeah play some rugby on the weekend but 
know, come back into this environment where we're getting to mix it with the team and get into full training again and, with, you know, without having to worry about all the, all the stuff we've kind of been dealing with for the last six or so months. So are you not worried about it? Because, you know, it's the skivats, it's the cooties. You know, it's, it's something that we don't fully know about. It seems that guys of your age and shape aren't really worried about it too much. How do you feel personally about it? I, I think we've all got a responsibility to be conscientious in the way that we behave and, and look after one another. Um, we never know who's at risk of these sorts of things. Um, but as Nick's already touched on, there's a pretty stringent process over here. And they've really got their finger on the pulse in terms of testing. Um, you know, we're doing temperature testing at every meal time regularly. The sanitate their hand sanitization and wearing of masks is really strict, really tight as it should be. Um, and it, I think it just pays to be careful because, um, you know, we, as I say, we have a responsibility to kind of look after one another. So, Tom, here's a question out of right field. How cool was it scoring that try in the Varsity Cup against Cambridge for Oxford? That was cool. That was a very cool experience. That's winding the clock back a few years now, Matt. Yeah, well. Um, but, yeah, I'll, have, I'll happily reminisce on that sort of stuff if you want to go back there. Happy days. Is there a lot of the Cambridge-Oxford banter going on back and forth? We don't have that at SUNY Buffalo. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's a little bit. There's a little bit you come across. Um, and actually, it's pretty obnoxious, but my, my mask is actually an Oxford University uh, mask, which, you know, why not, hey? We're in a second, my friend. Uh, James, final thoughts on the tournament going forward or the series going forward. Is it part of a bigger series that's going to be an annual thing, or is that what you're hoping for? Yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, we've already got uh, lots of interest for next year. Um, the idea is that next year we will do a 12-stop uh, series around the globe, 16 teams, um, of which five or six will be based in uh, North American franchises. So we're almost there on that. Uh, but yeah, we're getting daily calls from investors, uh, potential host cities. So we see this growing massively next year. Uh, very excited. But right now, all our focus is just making sure that these guys are, are well taken care of, uh, making sure that we put on a real good show for the, uh, for the global audience um, and see where it takes us. And we'll check in with you guys next week and the week after as well. Uh, but, Nick, before we let you go, I got I to gotta say, I've been doing this show for quite some time. And I have three older brothers that really don't give a rat's ass about rugby or certainly watching their baby brother do any of this stuff. And I get an email from my brother, Kevin, you know, months ago when the pandemic started. And he says, hey, man, you got to see this. It was you doing the play-by-play the -play of people crossing the street. And I'm like, you know, I've seen it. It's awesome. But you bleep and blank. You got, why don't you watch my show once in a while? I know. Sorry about that. Turns out that uh, a social media following of a few thousand people that are quite into their rugby was, was all I thought I was, was worth. But um, if you've got a stupid British accent, and you talk about dogs chasing each other in the park, you can gather yourself 80,000 US housewives on Twitter. So uh, a note to you all out there. Your humility is appreciated, but you certainly entertained a bunch of us and gave us a good laugh. It was great stuff. Good. I'm glad. Thank you. On that note, I thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules down there. I know that, you know, you got to take time from putting the sunblock on, jumping off rocks into the water, riding mopeds and filming yourselves, singing songs. Uh, it's got to be tough down there. Uh, just watch out for the sun poisoning. Don't get hurt. Don't get COVID. Have a great time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. On that note, on behalf of Mr. James Walker, Mr. Nick Heath, and Mr. Tom Mitchell, I'm Matt McCarthy for Rugby Wrap-Up, signing off.